Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter, but not the spirit of a request. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story, Gardner misses call for multi-million dollar wedding preparation. Boss threatens to fire if not there in 15 minutes. Gardner goes back to bed, ignores calls all day. The second story, employee is certain she knows better, is wrong, and FAFO. The third story, during military generator testing in California, a sergeant's malicious compliance with load banking instructions results in smoke blowing into a passing lieutenant general's car. Today's first story is, did I mess up your multi-million dollar wedding? Oops. Background. About 15 years ago, I was working as a very fancy gardener in Massachusetts. We tended to the House of Seven Gables and other wicked fancy places. One such location was the home of an extremely rich, I mean top richest people in the country. This is a huge investment management company. The house was known for filming parts of a perfect movie about a particular storm. I'm talking maybe a bound of wealth. For example, one job I was given was to rake the rocks on one of their personal beaches to make it more even. Yes, seriously. No, it never made a difference. I'm not as strong as the ocean. The daughter of the owner was planning on being married. On this property, it was months of preparation, from moving in a garden to covering parking lots, to planting moss between paving stones, and even us painting planters for, unloading, and planting dozens of Douglas fir trees. I mean, you guys, when I say over the top, this place had staging set up, yurts, I mean, it was insane. So the malicious compliance. The boss had this weird thing he did. Each morning, we'd get a call telling us where our first job was to be. We'd give the okay and head over there. Everyone lived in different cities, and it usually took 20 plus minutes to arrive anywhere after the call. Can you guess where this is going? The week of the wedding, the boss is slipping, not as cordial as usual. Okay, he's stressed. The day before the wedding, we bust A. I tell my boss I have another gig with my second job the next day, and he gets peeved saying I can't leave this one tomorrow until it's done. Okay, when's it gonna finish? He didn't know. Okay, I prepare myself for the inevitable stress I'll go through the next day, with almost no sleep, and a cool 18 plus hour workday ahead of me. I'm young, no problem, I can do that. The next day I wake up and wait for the phone to ring. It does, but a good half hour later than usual it's the boss, screaming about where I am. I tell him I'm here, waiting for the usual call. He yells and says I need to show up, at the wedding site. In the next 15 minutes or you're fired. Guess who went right back to bed since the wedding site was over 25 minutes away? Can you also guess who didn't answer the numerous desperate calls from said employer? Begging please fell on my deaf, contentedly sleeping ears as the phone rang all day. I'm sure the wedding went well otherwise. I'm not even sure what part we were supposed to play that day, and I'm so happy I never found out. The next story is... No, you don't understand. I really wouldn't do that if I were you. As I talked about the last time I posted in here, I work in a union shop, and I've been a shop steward for most of my 25 plus year career. In that time I've seen some SH both figurative and literal. And every single time I've ever been unwary enough about how fate works to utter the words now I've seen everything, the universe will inevitably hand me its beer and say watch this. Stewards, despite the general perception of us, aren't there to defend employees who are accused of misconduct. We're there to defend the collective bargaining agreement. Meaning if you've well and truly effed yourself and your future with the agency we both work for, my role is primarily helping you determine which of your options for leaving you're going to exercise. I've been at this rodeo for a long time, and management and I generally have a pretty good understanding of how things are going to go. Enter Jackie. Jackie was one of those unbelievably toxic peaked in high school cheerleader types, with just enough understanding of what our employer does, how it's required to behave within federal guidelines, and what its obligations are when you utter certain mystical phrases like, I need an accommodation, or discrimination based on a protected class. To be clear, those things are not just law, they're also morally right to be concerned about. And so my employer actually bends over backwards and does backflips to be certain that they're going above and beyond the minimum. Jackie was not a minority in any sense. She was female, but in a workplace it's 80% female. That doesn't quite count. She may well have been disabled, but that was undiagnosed, I think, and I'm inclined to think her claims of it, much like most of the rest of the things she said, were complete fabrications. The point at which I got involved was at the tail end of over a year's worth of actions by Jackie in which it rapidly became apparent that her manager was, in fact, an excellent candidate for canonization. I got referred to her when one of my other union friends contacted me and said, Hey, 
Jackie so-and-so just got put on administrative leave, and it's total BS. Can you help? I get referrals like this a lot, both because I've been around forever, and because I have a pretty good track record for ensuring that people accused of SH they haven't actually done get treated fairly, so nothing stuck out to me as odd. I contacted her, and she had absolutely no idea why management would put her on admin leave, without any warning, and confiscate all of her agency-issued devices, access and instruct her that she was not to have any contact at all with anyone she worked with during work hours. This immediately sent up a whole host of red flags. For one thing, I know the senior HR guy that is the HR analyst boss who's involved. Having been down the road of difficult situation but this is what we can do negotiation with him many many times over the years. I don't always agree with him, but he's fair, and usually we can come to some sort of middle ground. At any rate he would never suspend someone out of the blue without a really really good reason. She knows what she's done. She has to. So I gave her my usual spiel of things to do and things you should not do. Don't tell me, or our employer, things that aren't true. Especially if you think it'll make you look bad if you don't. Don't talk to your coworkers. Don't talk to your friends about this, particularly because you live in a town of under 2,000 people. Everyone knows everything about everyone else. Do not talk with management or HR without me present, period. When they do start asking questions, keep answers simple, to the point, short, and do not give lengthy explanations. Tell them what they want to know, and otherwise shut the F up. I've been here and done this many times. I know this process very well. I can't tell you what they're going to do, but I can tell you what I think they're going to do and I'm usually either right or pretty close to being right. I have been surprised. Nearly three weeks went by of radio silence from the agency, other than a bland sort of we want to talk with Jackie about utilization of work assignments, tasks, and equipment. Email that tells you almost nothing while still being literally true. Finally, it was go time for a meeting, and I did something I haven't done in a really long time. I physically drove to Jackie's work site instead of attending virtually, over an hour and a half each way. What the hell? The weather was nice. We met ahead of going in and I asked her if she remembered the rules I gave her at the beginning. She said she did. I asked her if she'd been following them, and she said she'd been very careful too. Swell. In we go. During the meeting, it was almost immediately obvious to me from the questions they started asking that Jackie was in serious, serious SH. Not like written warning or pay reduction. No, they were going to go for termination, and she was probably going to be very lucky if they decided not to refer to it to the DA for criminal prosecution. An abbreviated summary of just the high points. Jackie had hundreds of confidential documents and electronic files in her personal possession, many of which fall squarely under HIPAA. She had emailed these out of the government system to one of the four or five personal email addresses she maintains. Her explanation for this was questionable. Jackie had logged overtime without permission, a lot. And on one memorable date, when she was vacationing in Europe with her family at the time, she said she'd called in to attend a meeting, but didn't have an answer why that meeting had apparently been 11 and a half hours long and nobody remembered her attending by phone. Jackie had audio recordings of disabled and elderly people with whom she was working, that she had taken without their consent or knowledge. A lot of them. Jackie's overall work product and system activity reliably showed that she was logging in at the start of her day, from home, and she worked some in the afternoon, but there were hours and hours of time when her computer was idle. She explained this as participating in union activity, which I knew was BS because Jackie is not a steward. Jackie has no idea what the collective bargaining agreement actually says about much of anything beyond stewards can do whatever they want, and management can't say SH, which is uninformed, shall we say. At any rate, steward activity must be recorded and time-coded as such. Jackie has never attended steward training and so didn't know this. Apparently nobody ever told her that. There's more. There's so, so much more, but in the interest of brevity, I'll summarize the next four months of my dealing with this woman by pointing back to the cardinal rules I gave her, and simply say, she broke every single one of them. A lot. When it finally got to the dismissal hearing that comes before the You're Fired GTFO letter, she told me going in that she wanted to run things. Because she had some stuff that she wanted to cover, but that she thought I probably wouldn't be A, comfortable doing, true, because it was irrelevant, B, didn't know much about, again, true, because she had invented details, story, and witnesses as participants, and C, she felt like I wasn't really on her side in this to begin with. Not quite true, she was a member, so my job is representation here. Me, I really don't think that's a good idea. I've done a lot of these, you should let me handle it. Jackie, no, I know what I'm doing, and I talked with my attorney about this a lot. You can't stop me. Me, you're right, I can't, but this isn't going to go the way you think it will. Jackie, I know, I'm right, they can't do this to me. Me, this isn't a good idea, but okay, it's your show. In we went and sat down. The senior HR guy I mentioned earlier was there and he gave me a funny look when I sat back, 
Laptop closed and said nothing. Dismissal meetings are actually our meeting, and we get to run them from start to finish. They're there to listen to. She started talking, and I have to give them credit they took notes, listened to the things she said, and kept straight faces the entire time. It went exactly as I figured it would. Just the things they'd asked her about in the first of the several meetings I attended with Jackie had covered terminable offenses on at least four or five different subjects, independent of one another. At the end when she finally wound down, they all turned to me, Jackie included, and asked if I had anything I wanted to cover, or that I thought may have been missed. Nope, I said, I think she covered everything already. I don't have anything to add. That afternoon I got the union copy of her dismissal notice. Generally they're open at least discussing the option of the worker resigning, and giving them a neutral reference going forward, but that wasn't in the cards. The last I had heard of Jackie, the Department of Justice was involved with her and her husband, and I'm reasonably confident that it didn't go well for her either. I do know that she'll never work for the government again, as the letter was pretty explicit about what information they would release to any government agency asking for a reference. So it goes. They followed the collective bargaining agreement, terminating her with ample just cause. The last story is... Malicious Jarheadedness Many moons ago, when dinosaurs walked the earth and the World Trade Center was a tourist attraction, not a memorial, I did a five-year hitch in the U.S. Marines. While military-grade idiocy provides many opportunities for malicious compliance, here's one of my favorites. We worked on a variety of generators for expeditionary power applications. When you need to build an airport and maintenance facility in the middle of a desert, for example. We had them in a variety of sizes, from 3 kilowatts, slightly smaller than what you use for a single-family home, all the way up to 800 kilowatts. Enough to power a suburb. Most of our work was in the 60 kilowatts to 200 kilowatts range. These generators have what experts refer to as big honking engines, and as such they generate a lot of smoke when they have a decent load on them. We would use a device called a load bank to test the generators themselves, and make sure they worked under load. They're basically massive electrical heating elements, that you hook up to the generator and turn them up until the generator is working at a decent slice of its capacity. Well, since we were maintaining these in California, we were only allowed to load bank the generators for a certain amount of time each year to cut down on emissions. As a result, on the day we did the load banking, we shot huge amounts of smoke out of these greasy, barely exercised 1400 cubic inch engines. We get a 200 kilowatt unit going, get it warm, start turning up the power, and one of the guys who works for me runs up yelling, shut it off. We get it shut down and he points up the road towards the car coming down the road, with the red and gold flags flying on the front bumper. The silence has been noticed by Sergeant Bob, our incompetent sergeant, who comes flying over to us, forehead veins bulging, spittle flying, and his massive sugar bowl ears flapping in the breeze. Sergeant Bob, why did you shut that down? Me, because, Sergeant Bob, what did I tell you to do? Me, load bank the 200 kilowatt jennies. Sergeant Bob, why aren't you doing it? Me, because, Sergeant Bob, so fire this back up and get going. Me, but, Sergeant Bob, but what? Are you too stupid to flip start switch? Start an effing generator? Huge engine spins to life. And flip a generator switch? Flips a load bank switch. Why is this so hard? Since you're too stupid to do it yourself, let me show you. As the load bank cycles, a huge plume of greasy black smoke belches from the exhaust of this generator, directly into the open windows of the general's car. The squeal of locking brakes sounds from the road, and my men and I disappear like farts in the wind, leaving QA to deal with an angry lieutenant general, who just got smoked in his brand spanking new command sedan. From our sheltered hiding spot, we watch the general and his driver walk up to QA, and just tear him open. Sergeant Bob didn't talk to us for three days. Hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Have a good day.